Opinions expressed during this show are those of the individual participants and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of their associated organizations or lifestyle radio. Pace Radio Show. We are live here at lifestyleradio.ca, and you can also find us live at Spreaker. I'm your host, Al Graham. Tonight, my joint host is the very well-known Allison Merlin. Hey. Hi, Allison. Hey, everybody. Hey, Al. Hey, Al. Hey. Uh, let's see, Allison. What's new and exciting in your neck of the woods? It's been a month since I spoke to you. Oh, uh, not too much, Al. It's been a really rough last month. I hate to tell everyone who's listening one more time. But bottom line again, as you know, those of us who are on the street looking for medicine are having a bit of a silly time lately, Al, just as usual. But hey, we'll change that. Fight continues. That's right. Yeah. Yes, the fight uh, will continue for for much longer still, so unfortunately. So. Well, let's not hope. Let's hope not much longer, but still. Yeah, let's hope it not. It continues. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Allison, before we get into the news, uh, I'd like to um, say congratulations to our, our free TY prize winner, and that's Richard Charon. I think, I hope I got his last name right. Right on. Richard, he's, uh, he's entered into the draw in the past, um, and he hasn't, hasn't won until... This week, so I'll be sending him uh, a TY issue one a DVD of the 2010 TY Expo. It's got six Very cool. Yeah, six discs. And then there's a pin set consisting of five pins for, you know, your carrying bag or your hat or. Excellent. You know, your, yeah, some people put them on the shirts, whatever, right? So, hey. or pin collectors. So, congratulations, yeah. Richard. Well deserved, buddy. Yes. So if uh, anybody else, uh, and you know, every once in a while, I'll change up the prizes. Um, so if anybody else wants to get a chance to win some free stuff, just go to uh, uh, the Pace website at uh, pace-online.ca uh, and just send us a message saying that you're looking for some, some free uh, TY stuff and everybody's name goes into a hat and I pull a name out. So. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. So, all right, now on to the news item. Wow. Uh, some, yeah, two things. Just quickly, uh, we've just noticed uh, on Facebook, uh, yes. and we've had been contacted, that cannabis culture in Toronto on King Street is in the process of being raided. Yes, just as we speak. Yes, yeah. Um, I saw it on Jody's uh, wall. It's on my news feed there. A while ago, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that location. I was at the Church Street location recently during the Karma Cup, um, but uh, I hadn't been to the King Street one. The one on Church Street was nice, though. You know, I'll tell you, I haven't been to any of them out, but if I ever did frequent downtown and needed some medicine, I wouldn't hesitate to stop into a dispensary in that area. So the yeah. police better learn that we're not going anywhere. And as we've said for now quite some time, and as I protested in Ottawa on Parliament Hill with people like Neil Hanneman, Stitch Grady, my partner Gary Lynch, and many others, yeah. dispensaries are indispensable, Al. Well, uh, talk, yeah, talk about dispensary raids. Ottawa just had some raids. You bet they did. Uh, yeah, they just you had some as well. By, yeah. by law enforcement yeah. and stuff. Exactly. One more time. Police just don't get that. We're not going to stop. We're not yeah. going to stop. Patients like my, myself and many others across the country, if we don't have a source and aren't able to garden for ourselves or have something go wrong with our garden for a short period of time, we need those dispensaries to help us through. I will not, I will not, I will not buy from a licensed producer. I do not have that kind of money. Right. 
Uh, it's yeah, uh, it's uh, it's that's a, that's a really hard, tough pot, spot for patients is affordability. It's absolutely disingenuous of our government. You know, I still can't believe. I, honestly, it's shocking. Yeah. Yeah. Well. We, yeah, it, it's it's all we can do is keep hoping for change. Keep, hey. keep fight, keep fighting, and keep speaking up. And we are, and darling. That. Yeah, and we yeah. are. You know, we talked about uh, just briefly about Ottawa. There, you know, Neil Hammond. He was in the city council. You bet he was. You bet he was. And as we told Neil, you know, again, it's a cannabis revolution. Join us. It's a joint effort. Come on, everybody. Talking about joint effort and cannabis revolution. Look what's going on. Look what's going on south of the border after yesterday's votes. I know. Isn't that crazy? (laughs) Honestly, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. I'm literally not sure what to do today. I said that to quite a few people. But you know what? Part of me says, let's give anybody a try that won the right to be president of the United States. Oh, I'm not even, I'm not even, I'm not even talking about the president. I'm talking about, I'm talking about, I'm talking about the legalization. Hey, I was going to go there. I was going to go there. Both Trump and Clinton were for legalizing. So (laughs) they were both for it. Yeah. They were both for allowing the states to make up their own decisions. And and that's what we, that's what we saw there yesterday. Four states, California, Massachusetts, Maine and Nevada, Nevada. All voted to legalize. Yeah, Nevada, exactly. That's and you know the coolest thing is not just for medical, as you know, it was well, no, for Nevada, Massachusetts, Maine, California, and Arizona were for recreational. Arkansas, yeah, so in Arizona didn't. Arizona didn't pass. Yeah, Arkansas, uh, Florida, Montana, and North Dakota were all for medical marijuana, which was very cool for patients like us. Yes. Well, you know, so, uh, what have we got now? So now down in the U.S., okay? Yes. If there's now eight states that yes. are now legalized for recreational. Two of those, actually, I would think, isn't there almost three of them? Is the Washington not up against the Canadian border? Alaska is yes. up against the Canadian border. Yes, and yes. I believe Maine, Maine is up against yes. the Canadian border. Yes, wow. yes, yes. Oh, yeah, as I said, it's only a matter of t- federally. It's just a matter of time before it becomes legal in the United States. Canada yeah. already is well on its way, as you know. We legalized medical um, yeah. over a decade ago. You know, it's yeah. just well, a matter I- of time now for people to catch up. As you said, Arkansas, Florida, and North Dakota passed their, their medical regulations or the purposes for that. Yes, and yes. Which now gives them... And Montana. 20, yeah, 26 states now. I know. Isn't that crazy, Al? Yeah, 20% of the country. Right half, half of the states. Half of them, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. That is so cool. That's, uh, that's uh, yeah. Out. That's why I said it's a cannabis revolution. Everybody stand up. It is a joint effort. <laughs> yeah, oh yes, for sure. It's right. It's right. And, you know, it's from people getting up and, and speaking up and, uh, you know, voicing their opinions. And their, you bet. You know, it, all, it all helps and it all puts in together. And that's something that our guest does. And exactly, and we thank you all and especially our guest tonight for doing exactly yeah. that. Yeah, she's a person who stands up for patients' rights. She's also a patient herself. Yes. So I'd like to welcome Alicia Smith of the Saskatchewan Medical Cannabis Association of the Pace Radio Show. Alicia, how are you? Hey. Hey, Alicia. Welcome, Alicia. How are you doing, sweetheart? Hey, it's great to be here. Good to have you. Good to have you, honey. All righty. Uh, Alicia, welcome back to the show. Uh, this is going to be interesting to talk to somebody uh, from a Midwest perspective because, you know, quite often you hear from people in the, you know, here in the East, in Ontario, and people from BC, but uh, you're in the Midwest of Canada, so it's going to be interesting talking to you again. <laughs> Good old Saskatchewan, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, well, Alicia, you know, t- I was going to say, I'll just quickly, Alicia, you know that I'm from Saskatchewan originally. Born and bred yeah, in Regina, yeah. I am. 
That's awesome. There's always the Saskatchewan <laughs> folk in, in the crowd somewhere. You know what, honey? They don't know what they fed us out there, but look at us now, eh? Go Rough Riders. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If people were that passionate about their civil rights as they are about Rough Riders, this world would be a different place. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, true. Okay, well. No offense to football, but. <laughs> All righty, I'll let uh, I'll let um, Allison get uh, going here with the questions, and I'll just follow along as you time goes. Betcha. You betcha. Well, again, Alicia, welcome to the Pace Radio Show again, sweetheart. I wasn't here a couple of years ago when you were on last time, but I do know that we have a few new listeners like myself, and we would love if you tell our listeners. And those of us who never heard your story, a little bit about your pretty little self, honey. Okay, sounds good. Um, so in 2008, when I first discovered medical cannabis for um, a diagnosis of Crohn's disease, there was me and I guess a handful of other patients who had come to realize that there was nothing locally in terms of patient support, anywhere you could go for information. There was a head shop in Regina that was largely influential in us creating the Saskatchewan Medical Cannabis Association because it was a place where you can go and get your meds. Um, but we wanted a, a place where you could go and information share, kind of hang out, share your story, get to know one another, and um, basically just uh, do activism work that no one was doing um, any type of events within Saskatchewan, I, I guess I should say specifically Regina, in terms of educating others about medical cannabis. And so we took it upon ourselves to um, fulfill that role and task. And so, yeah, that's how our organization was formed. And we started doing 420 events and um, different rallies when the government would change the laws in terms of uh, medical cannabis and just um, regular um, recreational cannabis. Excellent. Now, was it just, not just, but obviously your issue of Crohn's is very serious, but was it that specific issue that turned you or converted you from the usual pharmaceuticals to things like cannabis? Oh, for sure. I was suffering. Like when I was diagnosed in 2004, from 2004 to about 2008, um, I was um, a heavy user of uh, pharmaceutical drugs and I became physically addicted to opiate painkillers because um, my Crohn's disease was so severe that it affected every part of my digestive system. And so I couldn't right. eat or even drink water for that matter without having some type of opiate painkiller. But the kicker was is that it wasn't helping me at all because I was still living in pain. And so I was... Um, um, at uh, a restaurant with a friend who was a, a toker and right. he suggested that I had one toke and, and before I was actually um, really anti-cannabis because I had a bad experience in high school and I right. had smoked too much and so it kind of really like skewed my perspective of what cannabis was, right? So I, I didn't touch right. it until um, I came back to it when I absolutely needed it for medicinal purposes. And right. so, yeah, I took one toke and I'll never forget the re instant relief of pain that I got. And I was um, a true believer from that moment on because there was no pill previous to that that could provide such relief in such a quick uh, uh, amount of time. Like I had to take chemotherapy for my Crohn's disease to try and control it. Right. And so I used to vomit right. for at wow. least three days a week. And so they were giving me pills. And so the pill would stay right. down for a whole two minutes and it would come up. So there was nothing to help with the vomiting. And when you vomit for three days straight, like, yes. I mean, anyone knows when they get the flu, that that's, right. that's just atrocious on your body. Like you get malnourished, you get dehydrated. And so cannabis was just a godsend. Um, I was oh, able to get off awesome. opiate painkillers, and, and my Crohn's went into remission because of the cannabis. You know, it's funny, actually, on that note, actually, I'll jump towards something that Al and I were discussing earlier. We were watching one of your videos that's online, Alicia, and this specific video is about you suing the Saskatchewan government insurance company. And I'd like to tell, or for you to tell a little people, a little a few of our listeners, pardon me, uh, our listeners, a little bit about uh, what your uh, your suit actually involves and how it came about, you know, how you started that. That was very interesting. 
Okay, so in 2000, I was in seven car accidents total. Um, wow, you, seven, which, when I was in seven high school. car accidents. And then wow. in two, oh, Alicia, three. you shouldn't drive, honey. Don't drive. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't even, only two of seven were my fault. <laughs> so it's people hitting me. I know it makes me look like such a bad driver, right? <laughs> I'm actually Poor a really good man. driver, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> but so we have a no-fault system in Saskatchewan, so there's no okay. kind of blame placed upon the driver. Right. So lucky me, the right. ones that hit me, right? <laughs> right. Nonetheless, so in, in 2003, I had a car crash, and I went to the doctor because I was in a lot of pain. I had whiplash, headaches, um, lower back pain. And he oh, prescribed nice. me Vioxx because at the time it was thought that NSAID painkillers were perfectly safe and you could prescribe yes. them to children and nothing would go wrong. So fine, okay. I took these pills until until about 2004 when I had another car accident. Oh, no. <laughs> and, um, so oh, no. on, I was in a car accident on June 21st, 2004, and by June 29th, 2004, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Um, but That's... the real special thing about my case was is that I not only had intestinal bleeding from the Vioxx, I also got iritis in my eyes. And so in the 25 years of practice, um, my GI specialist had never seen seen that and so it was really um, I guess neat for them um, to see this and none of the nurses at the hospital in their years of practice have never seen it also so it's about one percent of people who get um, Crohn's disease basically in your eyes Wow really just so you oh know uh, I've got Crohn's disease Alicia I haven't yes. got that problem but I have you know see I, I, I know exactly what you've gone through. Oh, That's what Al and I were discussing, <laughs> actually. Exactly. You know, the fact that your Crohn's was brought out by this car accident, I found that very, I was almost fascinated. I thought, I've never heard that. For sure. And, and the thing is, is like that's the, I guess, real kicker about Crohn's disease is there's no direct cause. No one can say, yeah. well, this caused right. it or that caused it or, you know what I mean? There's a multiple thing, a, a array of different things that can cause it. But I um, recently went to a neurologist and he said, well, yeah, the Vioxx causation makes a lot of sense. However, right. um, there's they're also finding in research that when you get a whiplash injury, right. it actually right. affects the nerves in your in your neck yes. and those nerves have to um, talk to the nerves in your gut and when they don't talk because of a whiplash injury that's when you run into problems so like your gut forgets wow. to fight off the bad bacteria and allows the, the um, good and bad to grow but an overgrowth of bad bacteria and that can also cause digestive system disorders as well yeah no yeah. stress yeah, no yeah, and yeah. the stress on top of that, Alicia. Good luck, I'll tell you. We'll be keeping our eyes crossed for that for you. The uh, you, you mentioned so that, I, uh, you, I guess my you mentioned oh, sorry. Um, my lawsuit speaks to the fact that I had asked um, my insurance provider to pay for um, my medical cannabis prescription because in 2011 I was in you. another car accident. <laughs> the guy hit wow. me this time. And um, oh actually gosh. three days later I had a quite severe Crohn's attack after the car accident. Wow. So was it a coincidence? I don't think so, right? Yes, like, no um, And so at that time I had a cannabis prescription and so I thought that because I can't take opiates because I was previously physically addicted to opiates, it would be um, not in my best interest to ingest them anymore. Right. And quite frankly, I can't. My body has just resisted. And so I asked them to consider covering my um, cannabis prescription. And so at the time, they said, "Oh yeah, yeah, you know, we'll we'll look at it." And so they made me and my grower um, jump through all types of hoops to prove like my prescription and how much it costed right. and how much it costed him to grow and such. And so we we were right. willing to do this. And then they just ignored me for five years, and so hence the lawsuit. Wow, wow. So can I ask, Kalisha, the lawsuit was launched in 2011, was it? No, it was actually launched this past summer, but because um, oh. recently I had asked them to go back and look at paying for the cannabis, and their doctor oh. basically said, no, you can take opiates. Okay, okay, okay. I wasn't aware of that because I didn't see a follow-up. I was just going to say that on the CBC story I posted. There was a story that I posted that I think we had found on you about you suing the government, about your schooling, et cetera, and yeah, you know, your illness. Actually, I, th I believe Alicia is dealing with two lawsuits. Am I not right, Alicia? Oh. 
<laughs> yes, yes. The, the first one was um, that right. I was... Okay, okay well, hang on. Well, before, before we get into the two separate ones, let's go yeah. from break. Yep. And then when we come back from break, we'll be able in the next segment cover the two uh, the two lawsuits that you're Fabulous. involved in. All right. Sounds good. So let's, let's go for break. And as we go into break, we're going to hear from uh, the Tall Brothers. And then Allison and our guest, Alicia Smith, will continue this discussion when we get back. Right listen on. To Pace Radio. You're listening to Pace Radio Show here at Lifestyle Radio.ca. Radio. You're listening to Pace Radio Show. Pace Radio. You're listening to Lifestyle Radio. You get me too high. I overanalyze. If you've ever been too high, then you can sympathize. You get me too, too high. And I start to fly, but said some silly thing, and that's the reason why. Shiva, my sativa, you get me too high. Canada, the time to act is now. These days, your customers are seeking variety. Increase your earning potential by expanding your inventory with CC Nexus, Canada's largest cannabis seed wholesaler. CC Nexus stocks over 60 reputable breeders, including Canuck Seeds, with a wealth of auto flower, regular, feminized, and CBD strains. All first-time customers will receive a free pack of Canuck Seeds, plus a mug, t-shirt, and additional promotional materials. Add strains and increase your profit with CC Nexus, your Canadian-owned and operated wholesaler of cannabis seeds. Discreet, worldwide stealth shipping from Canada, supporting you locally. Call today, 1-844-843-7995. 1-844-843-7995. Or visit us at ccnexus.global. The following is a public service announcement from the Canadian Therapeutic Cannabis Partners Society. The Canadian Therapeutic Cannabis Partners Society is a non-profit organization dedicated to ensuring improved access to therapeutic cannabis and cannabis byproducts in Canada. With a federal government that has committed to legalizing cannabis, we feel it is our duty to ensure that the medicinal use of cannabis doesn't get lost in the process and that there are clear distinctions made between the medicinal and recreational use of cannabis. It is our mission to ensure that government regulation doesn't get in the way of a sick disabled or terminally ill person's right to use or produce this amazing natural health product. If you would like to get involved, you can contact us on the internet www.canadiantherapeuticcannabispartners.com On Facebook, CTCP Society Or search Canadian Therapeutic Cannabis Partners This is Al Graham of the Pace Radio Show. Are you keeping pace, as in keeping people advocating cannabis education? If you're not, and you're a cannabis consumer, then why not? Others are working hard every day to help educate people about cannabis, so you can enjoy your daily 420. Get involved and speak out. Be loud and proud so that you can keep pace. Tune into the Pace Radio Show every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to hear about people advocating cannabis education here on lifestyleradio.ca. Growing your own vegetables, flowers, or even medicinal plants can be a challenge without the right equipment and proper know-how. At BMA Hydroponics, not only are they your urban horticultural experts and suppliers, but their staff holds the customer's needs paramount to making a sale. Family-owned with decades of experience and knowledge, they offer free advice in person by phone or email. BMA Hydroponics wants to ensure you have the advice you need, which is why you'll find tips and tricks on different ways to grow, like WIC, Ebb and Flow, Drip, or Aeroponics System, as well as other helpful links at bmahydroponics.com. If you can't find what you're looking for, just let them know, and they'll do everything they can to get what you're looking for. At BMA Hydroponics, each staff member also possesses a federal exempt MMAR license, making their strong suit, empathy, experience, and dedication to their customers. Because when you know how to grow, you'll have results that make you proud. BMA Hydroponics in Belleville, Ontario. Visit bmahydroponics.com. BMA offers cannabinoid testing, so if you want to prove you've got good medicine, head to BMA Hydroponics and prove it. You 
get me too high. It's funny how the sky ain't cloud in every morning. Hello. I think Hi. we're back, but I'm not really sure. Hi, Alicia. I know we're back on air, but I don't know where Al Graham, the oh, host of the Al, show Al got, caught with, <laughs> Al got caught with his mic mute, muted. <laughs> there he is. Hi, Al. Welcome back, everybody. I'm having a great time. <laughs> oh, I hate when that happens, but it happens. <laughs> That's what, you know, Everybody got to hear that live. Brett Spreaker, tune in. Showcast, <laughs> we're right around. So, uh, I'm gonna let everybody also know that to tune in to the 420 radio show this Friday at 7 p.m. for two hours of conversation and information with Al Rapp, Lori McEachern, uh, Marcel Gignac, and Ross Middleton. Also, check out to Tamara Kitewright and her show Cannabis and Coffee with Tamara Wana. And that's live every Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. Mountain Time. That's 11 yeah, Eastern. Betcha. Yeah, and you can catch all that live at uh, lifestyleradio.ca. Excellent. Yeah. And tonight, Allison, we are joined by our guest, uh, Alicia Smith, the co-president of the Saskatchewan Cannabis... Oh, I missed the word. Medical Association. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. The Saskatchewan <laughs> Medical Cannabis Association. Association. <laughs> went, oh, oh I missed that. Sorry about that, Alicia. Uh, okay, uh, before, we got, uh, before we got into the break, um, Alisa, you were just starting to tell us about um, a couple of lawsuits that you're involved yes. in. For sure. Um, so I guess the one that was posted online today was the anniversary. Um, so I guess it was five years ago today, um, I was on CBC about a lawsuit that I had against the University of Regina. Um, because they failed to accommodate my disability when I was in the Faculty of Social Work there. And so that led me to, um, I, I appealed their decision and I won, but fundamentally um, the problems that were existed at the faculty weren't fixed. And so I was forced to um, transfer faculties. And so I went to um, the Justice Studies program. And I also went one step further and I went to the First Nations University of Canada, which is a federated college. And yes. so... Um, accommodation there was just phenomenal they're really there for their students and so um that's how i graduated is because they um took accommodation seriously and so that lawsuit has actually been settled um a few years ago it was you but, um, i'm Where'd not you graduate in? i'm oh sorry where did you graduate in oh i graduated with a um a ba in justice studies with a minor in sociology just and it, a techni it's technically from the University of Regina, but in um, Saskatchewan, we have federated colleges. Right. And basically, that just means that you're a student of theirs, per se. And we did settle, but um, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to um, say what we settled <laughs> for. Yeah, I, have a gag I understand order. that. For sure. <laughs> you bet. You bet. Yes, you understand. Yeah. I understand. You know what, Alicia, again, I think that's very brave of you because our listeners have to understand that if they too feel they've been wronged, then definitely one of the ways to get answers is through the courts and through the justice system. So on that note, Alicia, I just wondered how did your uh, health affect your um, schooling and your career, your choice of employment and your future career? Exactly which direction did that send you down? Um, so basically being discriminated for having an invisible disability, um, I was like in the Faculty of Social Work, you would think that they would be one of the most understanding places of yes. education, and in fact they weren't. Um, I was often scrutinized because you couldn't see my disability, so therefore in their minds it didn't exist. And um, accommodation was very poorly administered there, and um, it wasn't taken very seriously. Yes. And so... Um, when I went to um, like the Faculty of Arts, it was taken quite seriously. However, there's still a mindset that people who ask for accommodation, it's almost as if um, there's this stigma attached to it that you're asking for special privilege. And it's best. like, well, exactly. if you had to deal with Crohn's disease, or MS, or any type yeah. of invisible disability on a daily basis, you would understand. But most able-bodied yes. people 
can't see it from the perspective of someone who has an invisible disability. And that's very unfortunate because we often forget that no one is exempt from disability. You can have all all the money in the world, but it does not exempt you from cancer, Crohn's disease, MS, any type of ailment. Like, you can have perfect health your whole life and then suffer yes. your senior years in, in ill health. Like uh, me, when I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, I was 20. So I spent most of yes. my 20s learning how to deal with um, a God disease bless. that affected my entire life. Like Crohn's yeah. disease is a quite serious disease because I don't think that people realize that you can die from Crohn's disease. If you can't eat and you can, your body doesn't absorb um, vitamins and nutrients, like, uh-huh. you die. If, if you yes, have too much diarrhea, that's right. you get that's rid of right. all of the uh, nutrition hey. in your body. Oh. It's, uh, it's just, she's, a nasty, she's a nasty disease. Um, it's, uh, it, it, like you say, you can die from this, man. No <sighs> doubt about it. For sure, it. and... And, and so the fact that um, people, especially with digestive system diseases, people just don't get it. And it's like I had a professor one time laugh because um, my accommodation order said that I need to be situated beside a bathroom or have access to a bathroom. And it's oh like, my. well, perhaps it's funny to you because you can control your, bla- your um, bowels. But sometimes when you're in, uh, having a bout of a Crohn's yes. disease, you can't control your bowels. Like you have to uh, – Al, you can probably um, attest to this that uh, – or I, I guess testify to the fact Alicia, that you I can went to the bathroom the that's the and then you come part. out of the bathroom and you have to go can. back in because that's yeah. just that's that's the I mean the 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 Crohn's disease picture right like right. it is it, it, it's an it's a nasty, embarrassing disease, but in the same regard, it needs to be talked about because yes, that's the reason why there's such stigma attached to it is because people yes. don't understand. Yeah, I, I've had. I've had numerous people come and talk to me. They aren't sure whether they have Crohn's disease, but even if they have a bowel issue. And then, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Up, yeah, you end up getting into conversations about bowel movements. <laughs> yes, no, that's so true. <laughs> yeah. Double too, right? So. Yeah, no doubt. Oh, God bless you guys. And I thought I was just a mess. Holy jump, yeah, I, I have that mess. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've been going through a uh, flare up for the last, about the last month. Oh, no. uh, the, cr- the, the cramping and the cramping in the guts and the bowels is, is finally settling down. Oh, I can't but, even uh, imagine yeah. poor things. Uh, but yeah, people, you go. This it's something you go I, through. Like, and like Alicia says, it's invisible. People don't see that. Yeah, it's like MS. It's yeah. a lot of times. A lot of people yeah. say to me, "How can she be walking one day and in a wheelchair the next?" And yeah. I keep saying, yeah. "You live in my body." And you try and get down 13 steep stairs and keep going <laughs> every day of your life. <laughs> um, Alicia, so. we, we we talked about the one lawsuit there with the um, the university. Now, yes. you have a sec- the second lawsuit as well. Yes, and that well, that's the one against um, Saskatchewan government insurance with the car accidents right. and paying for the medical cannabis. Mm-hmm. And my hope is that um, they'll come around because they want to take it to trial. And I, I'm perfect. Um, perfectly well able to go to trial and I have no issue Good. with that because I have the backing and support of my doctors Good. but in the same regard nice. Um, nice. once it does go Good to luck. the judicial process um, yes. hopefully we'll set a precedent so that insurance companies do pay for medical cannabis because it, it, it needs to open the door um, somewhere it needs to start somewhere right and so Certainly I'm willing to yes. use that test, that test to open the door yep you know, you could even the the lawyer could even throw in the fact that in North America wide, there's a, an opiate epidemic happening, and here's a patient yes. who's looking for something else, another way of of treatment uh, to prevent that. Because I know for myself, I was the same way. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, I never took t- once I left the hospital. That was my last opiate. It's been nothing, you bet. nothing but cannabis wow. for 13 years. Wow. So, uh, yeah, you know, like wow. It, 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 and it, it could save the money as well. Yes, no doubt. Well, if I could get enough cannabis to stay away from those damn pills, I'd be off them too. So one day soon, everybody, one day soon. We'll keep our eyes crossed and we'll dot our T's and we'll see just what happens. So do you, you don't know how long that's going to take or you know, as, as far as the battle with the government end of it all, Alicia? Um, 
No, well, there's no anticipated date, really. Like I said, I was like, yeah. I'm fine with going to law school, and then I'll come back, and then we'll tango again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I have no go in and get, waiting, get uh, you, you know, know just like, get fresh, <laughs> totally fresh out of school. And uh, like I said, you're gonna you're gonna go to law school now. I was I uh, I had sent. Uh, I was talking with you earlier. Now the the type of law that you're looking at going to um, get educated on has to do with uh, disabilities. Yes. Yes, for sure. For sure. Like I want to practice um, civil litigation and criminal, obviously, in terms of um, cannabis and cannabis prohibition. But um, something that's near and dear to my heart is accommodation. Again, like being denied accommodation, you're being denied your basic fundamental human rights. And while some people think that when they accommodate you, if it's education, employment, that they're doing you a favor, but it's the law. Um, it's the law just like driving, the speed limit, just like guaranteeing a non-discrimination of people who are gay or, or Aboriginal or like this is the law and we often forget it because it has to do with people with disabilities. Like um, there's a statistic that 53% of people who have disabilities are unemployed. 88 wow. yeah 88% of people who have invisible disabilities are afraid to tell their employer that they have a disability that they should be accommodated for you know i was so, as a corrections officer Alicia. i so know that exact idea i know that exact issue i didn't tell a soul when i was in corrections because i was terrified i'd lose my career yeah i did i was at a I was at a place for uh, 22 years, and I didn't tell a soul until they saw me having to tie my clothes on myself. I, oh, my, I, had, I had literally shrunk that much, lost oh, that much weight, God. that I was I was God. using string to tie my pants on. Oh, oh God bless. See, is, that's horrible that people like us live with. Yeah. And there's so many of us out there, so many of our listeners all around the world who deal with these exact same issues. And again, Alicia, because of people like yourself and you too, Al, being as courageous as you are to speak about these issues, I guarantee you they may now too. Well, and that's what it's going to take yeah. is that everyone kind of has to you um, not, not be embarrassed of your issue. Like, I mean, like I said, no, no one is exempt from disability. And we often think that yes. disability is um, the picture of someone in a wheelchair, but that's not the case. Yes. There's so many different levels of disability ability and most often they're invisible you know what i mean we, so we need to let go of these preconceived notions of what we think yes. disability is because it, we it, don't it even so say disability different. alicia we don't even say disability we say we're differently able abled <laughs> because we are differently able it doesn't matter if we're using wheels or a sled or skis or you know anything to get around bottom line we're differently abled we're not disabled for sure so for and sure. that's and really important that people too, understand for sure. that too for sure yeah. yeah you betcha darling you betcha so obviously so, you're schooling and your choice sorry go ahead al sorry well i was gonna say you know disability laws uh, medical cannabis um now i don't know what your laws are like in saskatchewan uh, but I know here um, in Ontario, the government is um, coming up with laws to shut down vaporizing inside. And that was going to be my, one of my questions, Al. Was the law <laughs> <that was, laughs> a lot? Yeah. Do you, do you see a, an issue that or, where patients could come uh, as far as an argument to say, like, you know, these are places where we go uh, to medicate when we're out of our houses? Well, that's interesting because I recently read a case, I think it was in Ontario, that said that um, employers have a hard time um, pleading their cases against the use of medical cannabis because they can't prove hardship. And so and when it comes to accommodation, they have to be able to prove that um, they would be unduly, um, I guess, put in a disadvantage in order to accommodate yeah. you. Like, people don't realize, but it's it's human rights law, but it, it it's also constitutional law that um, you are to be accommodated. And you don't necessarily have to um, disclose your diagnosis. Like, the United States is so much further in terms of their um, disability and accommodation process. Um, they have the American Disabilities 
act that is really a profound and their rights are guaranteed far more than ours in Canada. And we have a decision, it's called Marion, and we're supposed to um, test different situations against this test case, right? But right. the jurisprudence in terms of like disability law in Canada is pretty um, weak. And that needs to change because it's not valued because there's no money in it, right? <laughs> At the end of the day, like, it, it's just, it, it's like the women's movement. It's like the, um, like, the, the cannabis movement, really. But it, it, the disability rights movement and advocacy for that movement has to come forward. And I think that that will come with the medical cannabis um, situation, too. Um, but my question at this time is, do we say that the courts and people can't discriminate people based on medical cannabis? Because the Supreme Court said that you don't have rights as a recreational user of cannabis, but what about people who use cannabis for medical reasons? Because people, yes. especially in my province, are discriminated on probably a daily basis if they choose to disclose or be um, out in public and profess that they're a cannabis, a medical cannabis user. Because yes. how many people... Um, I should tell you a story. I was um, interviewing for a job at Statistics Canada, and I needed to prove my Canadian identity. And so yes. I used my um, Health Canada MMAR card. <laughs> and um, <laughs> they, they <laughs> discriminated me because of the fact that that was the ID that I was using. And that really broke my heart because that was when Trudeau just got in and so I thought that the government was also progressive in their thinking but they are not right. especially like no. wow. I know the provincial government isn't but the federal government I expected better from them I well, really did I'm not so did, they, did, they, did they turn around and, before we go to break here uh, did they turn around and say that uh, your MNA card um, your, your photo and stuff on it would be um, too old because it is, you know, they were good, what, till 2014, right? No, it so wasn't an issue expired. whether or not it was um, too old because they just needed something to prove. Um, I guess it was like birth date because you, you could use like a passport yeah. or a driver's license right. or something right. um, like officially provided by the government. Yeah. And I had forgotten my passport, so, so that's why I used <laughs> that card. And so, then right so, away, they randomly chose me to um, have like a a criminal record check that was above and beyond what was actually required wow. of the standard oh, no. process. So they were Shocking. labeling me like a criminal because I had like a medical marijuana card. And that's Alicia. fine because I know I'm not a criminal, but in the same regard, how many you other people it. have actually had enough balls to do what I did? I guess it was, a, it was exactly. an experiment. I, I'm, I really like social experiments and see, <laughs> and to, to see how people respond. <laughs> <laughs> you're amazing, yeah. Alicia. You're just like me. You scream like me. I love it, honey. You're a firecracker, right. and that's it's, what it's, need. it's break time. Time you to go bet. for that commercial break. You All right. Uh, so we're gonna hear some more from the Tall Brothers uh, <laughs> with their song "You Get Me Too High," and then we'll turn our conversation back with um, guest Alicia Smith. And you're listening to Pace Radio Show here at Lifestyle Radio. Ca. You're listening to Lifestyle Radio. Shiva, my sativa, you get me too high. Growing your own vegetables, flowers, or even medicinal plants can be a challenge without the right equipment and proper know-how. At BMA Hydroponics, not only are they your urban horticultural experts and suppliers, but their staff holds the customer's needs paramount to making a sale. Family-owned with decades of experience and knowledge, they offer free advice in person by phone or email. BMA Hydroponics wants to ensure you have the advice you need, which is why you'll find tips and tricks on different ways to grow, like WIC, Ebb and Flow, Drip, or Aeroponic System, as well as other helpful links at bmahydroponics.com. If you can't find what you're looking for, just let them know, and they'll do everything they can to get what you're looking for. 
At BMA Hydroponics, each staff member also possesses a federal exempt MMAR license, making their strong suit, empathy, experience, and dedication to their customers. Because when you know how to grow, you'll have results that make you proud. BMA Hydroponics in Belleville, Ontario. Visit bmahydroponics.com. BMA offers cannabinoid testing. So if you want to prove you've got good medicine, head to BMA Hydroponics and prove it. The National Task Force on Medicinal Cannabis is a group of not-for-profit organizations dedicated to influencing government policy with factual evidence. Our mission is to ensure that a constitutional medical program is developed that will address the concerns of all Canadians that require therapeutic cannabis. The task force is looking for dedicated people who are willing to contribute to our cause. We have formed this task force to foster a unified approach and focus on lobbying the federal government and Health Canada. We represent the combined expertise of thousands of patients with more than a decade of experience. As a task force participant, you, your business, or your group will have an opportunity to show that you care and offer your unique skills to promote the cause. If you would like to get involved, go to medcanataskforce.org. That's medcanataskforce.org and use the Contact Us link to get started. Help us help you. Tune into the Pace Radio Show and catch Kim Cooper, Debbie Stoll Skiffin, or Allison Merlin, along with myself, Al Graham, as we talk to Canadian and international cannabis advocates who are working hard to help patients and to end cannabis prohibition. Catch us live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here at lifestyleradio.ca. Canada, the time to act is now. These days, your customers are seeking variety. Increase your earning potential by expanding your inventory with CC Nexus, Canada's largest cannabis seed wholesaler. CC Nexus stocks over 60 reputable breeders, including Canuck Seeds, with a wealth of auto flower, regular, feminized, and CBD strains. All first-time customers will receive a free pack of Canuck Seeds, plus a mug, t-shirt, and additional promotional materials. Add strains and increase your profit with CC Nexus, your Canadian-owned and operated wholesaler of cannabis seeds. Discreet, worldwide stealth shipping from Canada, supporting you locally. Call today, 1-844-843-7995. 1-844-843-7995. Or visit us at ccnexus.global. I overanalyze If you've ever been too high Then you can sympathize You get me too, too high And I start to fly If I said some silly thing Then that's the reason why Shiva My sativa Hey, thank you for tuning in to the Pace Radio Show We are being broadcasted live here at lifestyleradio.ca But you can also catch us at www. 420radio.ca as well as at the Pace Radio Show website found at pace-online.ca Tonight uh, for a break we feature the BC based band known as Tall Brothers and the song You Get Me Too High If you enjoy tonight's music then I'd like to suggest that you check out the Tall Brothers at their website found at tallbrothers.ca or at 420tunes.ca Tonight on the Pace Radio Show I'm joined by our guest Alicia Smith of the Saskatchewan Medical Cannabis Association, Association. <laughs> and my joint host, Allison Merlin. Hi, ladies. Hello. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. All right. Uh, Alicia, Before, just before we were going into break, um, you're talking about the rights um, for patients. Um, yeah. And you know, you're, you're dealing with that as far as uh, going through uh, for, for your lawyer. Um, we have a situation that was just uh, in our local newspaper here, and it's been shared around on Facebook, um, where a fellow went into surgery at a hospital, and he was denied his cannabis. Oh, I think I saw that article, yeah, but it, I didn't have a chance to read it. Um, see, that's a problem, because I know when I... Because I was hospitalized 62 times for my Crohn's disease. Like, I used to spend, like, I had my own little, like, ward at the hospital. (laughs) Because, like, there's nothing that could um, put it into remission. And it was attacking not only my guts, but my stomach, my esophagus, my mouth. Like, um, 
do you is your Crohn's pretty isolated to one part of your digestive system, or do you experience no, it in uh, all? It, on the lips to the butt, I had the cankers in the mouth, oh, so yeah, ileum, duodenum, all the organs through there. I had dealt with fistulas. Wow! And I'm happy to say I'm sur- I am surgery free. Wow! That's nice. Yeah. Yeah, That's good because, no like, I don't know. I think I'm I'm kind of against surgery because they say that the Crohn's will manifest right where they cut, anyways. So it's oh, I, I don't wow. know if I necessarily agree with that um, process. Um, but yeah, so like I I had a hell of a time with it, and if I would have been able to have cannabis in the hospital, even a vaporizer, I think yes. that that would have been a, a phenomenal step in my recovery. So the fact that hospitals are denying patients access to use their cannabis in medical facilities is a basic denial of their human right, and I think mm-hmm. that that should be stopped almost immediately. You know what, Al? I do have to interject here. I have not touch wood been hospitalized for quite a number of years here where I live in Burlington, Ontario in Canada. But I will let people know that not only do I have opium waiting for me at the, or sorry, raw heroin, I apologize, waiting for me at the hospital when I go because of this violent pain that I experience all the time. But I also am able to consume cannabis in a number of ways, including vaporization at the hospital where I live here in Burlington, Ontario, called Joseph Brandt. Now, this was a number of years ago, so I really apologize. I'm not up on what the hospital will and will not allow these days, but I know that if I had to be hospitalized, like you said, Alicia, it is a fundamental right and a constitutional right in this country for us to have relief from is our issues, whether it be excruciating pain or other issues associated with our illnesses. So very important I, I, that people understand. I, yeah, I know in this case, they, they said, uh, you know, they have situations where they accommodate uh, medications from other sources where they have put it away for the patient. But obviously, right. if they're going to they're going to put it away for the patient, but they weren't yes. going to allow the patient any access to it. Yes. Where was that exactly, Al? I didn't see uh, that. I'm sorry. Uh, Kingston. Kingston. Um, yeah, uh, Nate Oxford. That's oh, that's from the Kingston <laughs> there. For yeah. sure. God bless. I know, Holy. I know ahead, in Saskatchewan uh, at the, the rehabilitation hospital here, um, they actually made like an in-house policy um, that said that patients could have access to their kind of like they, yes. it is in a hospital, but it is kind of like a hospital, like it's a rehabilitation place. But some people are permanent residents there, and so um, they they drafted a policy that said that um, patients are to have access to their cannabis, not smoking, obviously, but um, right. vaping and whatever else. But in my opinion, a hospital could easily accommodate a person by putting them in their own room and having yes. a well ventilated um, room for them to use yes. their vapor um, device, right? Yeah. So it's, it's not um, like that we're asking for them to make these big changes. It's, it's quite easy no. to accommodate someone who uses a vaporizer. So um, I think that it just comes down to stigma again that um, people yeah. who ask to have a different form of medicine be ingested while under the care of a physician at a hospital is um, contrary to popular um, standard, and so that's why it's kind of questioned or denied, which is unfortunate, but it's yes, not reality, yeah, Alicia, right? I know if I were hospitalized, and I want all of our listeners to know, stand up for your rights, because I know that would never happen to me. I would do it whether they allowed me to or not. So, and I don't care, oh Alicia, arrest me on the spot. <laughs> Sorry, everybody, but that's the way I feel, especially with the stupid pain in my cheek tonight. Yeah. Boy, oh the, odd, the odd time you'll see a post on Facebook, somebody's got a vape pen in their room. You bet they do. I've always, every time I've been in the hospital, I've posted vaporizing everything I've done, eating cookies, every single way that I've ever taken cannabis, I've posted in the hospital. So, and I want patients to do that. Speak up and stand up. Know your rights. Yeah. You yeah there's there's going to come a time where they're going to have to accommodate and, like, you know, uh, at least says his rights. And our, our hospital is going to start denying patients access to cannabis. You know, they're doing it over in Israel where they're allowing, they've got a section where patients they can sure are. Us. 
They sure are, and they have been since I've been doing news articles and media for decades, Al. And you know what? I remember years ago doing an article for CH News here in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and it had gone across satellite to a uh, family that I knew on the East Coast, and they were questioning about Israel and Israeli patients in the same uh, our, uh, editorial or not editorial ed, our media piece that I was in, uh, being given cannabis as medicine in hospitals in Israel, while again patients like me were doing it in Burlington, Ontario, Canada. Yeah. So you yeah. better believe we have rights again. Stand up for your rights, people. If you don't trust me, they will be usurped. I'm sure Alicia agrees. Oh, for Stand sure, and I think rights. that education, right? Like, um, I don't yeah. think that the patients have to be um, pushy and kind of like in your face, but uh -huh. it did, I mean, warrant no. it for sure. But I think that yeah. most oftentimes people kind of get a little bit Ooh, about cannabis is because they're, don't forget, they're ingrained with like reef or madness yeah. and all kinds yeah. of other, you know, horrendous things about cannabis. And so uh, like a polite lesson on this is my right and, you know, yeah. this helps me and, and that, 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 that goes a long way because I think that sometimes people are just like afraid of something that they don't know. And I mean, that's sad, but in the same regard, like um, educators, that's what activists are, especially in the cannabis community is that educators, you know, that's exactly and so oftentimes should. people need to be educated. Like doctors don't even know about cannabis because they were never trained on cannabis. And so I Very often true. find myself like uh, when I do presentations at hospitals or nursing homes and stuff, um, it's often the doctors and the nurses who want to be educated because they yes. don't know about it, but they want to. You know? Yes. And, but it's up to us, though, Alicia. That's excellent. I'm glad you oh, brought that sure. up. It's us to, up to us. Education is the key. And it's yeah. up to us to educate our doctors, pharmacists, chiropractors, nurses, dentists, anybody that we choose, that we happen to use cannabis around as a choice of our medicine. It's up to us to tell them why we prefer it over all these pharmaceuticals that they all want us to have. So it's definitely a right to you. Yeah. Now, Alicia, you just mentioned uh, presentations at hospitals. Um, but how are they going? Um, good. So I do um, two different presentations. Like I do one, it's called Cops Cannabis in Your Rights. And so basically, um, I like to educate people on their civil rights because, again, we aren't taught. Um, when you're approached by a police officer um, or an officer of the law, what you're supposed to say, yes. what you can say, what you shouldn't say. And so yes. most often um, people get in trouble in terms of cannabis because you can smell it. So then they have um, probable cause to search you. But in some incidences, yes. they don't. But I just want um, safe consumerism of your rights and of cannabis use, whether that's recreational or whether that's medicinal. And so that's one presentation that I give, but there's also a presentation that I um, give to medical professionals, like at hospitals, nursing homes and such, um, and nurses too. Um, I'm actually preparing one for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation um, chapter in nice. Regina that um, basically just edu educates um, people on what cannabis is, where can you get cannabis, um, how does it help? Um, what yeah. can I do in terms of like research and study? Like who can I contact? And it's just basically um, education on um, how to access it, essentially. Um, yeah, I, I and I think a, that a lot of a lot of um, medical professionals, like I said, they don't necessarily they're not necessarily against it, but they don't know where to find the answers. And so, unless you're an activist and you seek out those answers yourself, you're not generally going to go and um, I guess find those answers and so my big thing is getting RN nurses to sign um, prescriptions and educate them on right. their ability and their power to be able to do so Good for you. And, so I think, yeah, and I think I think that yeah. nurses really appreciate the fact that they are able to um, provide the medicine doctors. because previously it was just doctors where um, you nurses bet. want to heal and we're aid in eliminating the suffering of people, right? And so if they can do that by helping you get your cannabis prescription, for sure. Yes, I agree, Alicia. Wonderful, fabulous yeah. work, my friend. Now, you mentioned the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. <laughs> I have a little story about them for you. I have a friend okay. uh, who has worked uh, along beside me at shows in Toronto, whether it was a home show or wellness show, a woman's show. 
And, that, and her online name is Anya Ganja. That's her Twitter handle. <laughs> and she did a protest uh, in Toronto with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation to the point where she got them to change the information that was on the website. Excellent. On the oh, website nice. to deal with cannabis. So um, if you ever want to... Uh, Connection to Tartar, let me know. I can connect you. <laughs> but she has <laughs> Crohn's as well. Were they previously she, were they previously not advocating for the use of cannabis? Was that the issue? <coughs> well what they were what she was what she was fighting for was to get them to um, change wording or reckon yeah, to recognize cannabis uh, helps people with Crohn's. And she, yeah. and she got them to to uh, slightly change some wording on the web on the website, so it wasn't um, um, negative. Beautiful. Oh, that's brilliant. Good for yeah. You. yeah. Good for you, Anya Ganja. Right on, baby. <laughs> what well, was that, Alicia? And, and I think that that's important too, right? Because they are largely yeah. funded um, by pharmaceutical companies. That's the bulk of their funding. And they so sure um, I know when I was first diagnosed, that was my very first place to go was um, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and the chapter because they allegedly seem to have known um, what was good for patients. But in all honesty, they yes. don't. <laughs> you know? like Had me. I known about cannabis right from day one, I think that my path would have been a whole lot less of suffering. You know, that like, was like me I, I, I think that. that with a disease like Crohn's disease, it's a given that you there there will be some suffering. I mean, it's not an easy disease, and I, I no. um, I'll never forget a doctor who said that if he could have any disease or uh, one disease that he would never want to have is Crohn's wow. disease because it's basically wow. like one of the hardest diseases to have to deal with and come to terms with because it is. It's like, wow. I mean, it Thank it so deals much. with the way that you nourish your body. And if you're not yes. properly nourished, you're, you're not living. You know what I mean? You're yes. barely living. Yeah. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, you know it's like funny, so Alicia. dealing with it in itself, and and it's embarrassing, right? Like, like basically, how yes. do you tell someone, "Oh, I poop a lot"? <laughs> oh, <it's funny. laughs> it's like, uh, you know, it's funny. Well, you know, Al, I just on, wanted right? to, I just wanted to mention. Sorry to the Jeff, but actually, you mentioned something about uh, educating the society, the Crohn's and uh, Colitis Society about cannabis as medicine. I just wanted our listeners to know way back when in the 1990s when I started fighting for this as cannabis as medicine for multiple sclerosis among all of our other issues, uh, I actually had a run-in with the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Canada in so much so that at the time I had students helping me with my garden. It was the summertime and uh, uh, they actually, uh, the Globe and Mail did a big story, a radio interview and some pictures, etc. cetera. And it was all out on the uh, line somewhere, but it ended up that uh, the MS Society fought me so hard with cannabis, uh, me coming out and using cannabis as medicine, that they pulled all of my students from me. And to this day, I no longer have any help in my home from the MS Society of Canada because of choosing cannabis as medicine. They, at the time, they felt that I was uh, exposing the young people who were coming to help me uh, to uh, secondhand smoke and issues that they couldn't control. So, wow, you know, that's that was a big my disappointment. Backyard. So, like, to, wow. Yeah, it was terrible. That was the global mail that stepped in. The media, again, Alicia, saved patients like me back in the 1990s. When were you were using cannabis as medicine? When nobody, and I mean nobody, called it or even believed it was medicine, but the few of us who used it and got relief. No, well, it was terrible, to you. That's, that's a big endeavor, especially during that time. Insane. Yeah, like. It was insane, Alicia. That's why I cannot believe how many people, including yourself, Al, all these people have come out since... You know, I felt all alone so many decades ago, and I wasn't then even, you know. But I'll tell you, when somebody told me it was a lonely road to go down to fight this, you know, I remember saying, hey, no problem, I'll bring all my friends. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, I, and, you know, it's taken patience, you know. You know, the, the fight for all this comes from all different hey, angles. It you sure know, the does. Patience, the patients are, you know, they it helps make a big difference. You know, when you see... Um, you know, the children that are involved. 
I honestly, I cannot thank everyone enough. It's been incredible the way people are speaking out now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Alicia, uh, Crohn's disease. Uh, I know that you know, it was fine for me to have, you know, maybe a cookie or two cookies, but if I had, oh. you know, multiple cookies, um, it wasn't the amount of cannabis that was the concern, it was the amount of cookie. <laughs> Ooh, I never <laughs> Did you have a method that you preferred to consume? Uh, just, you know, that was another cannabis? question I had for her. <laughs> That's funny, Al. <laughs> uh, I, I can see your notes, Alice. Yes, the Buzzroy's oil, dry smoke food. I have it all here, baby. <laughs> That's funny, Al. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, Lisa, do you, do you have a... Have a, um, so personally, uh, I prefer preferred route. Use, oh, sorry, preferred route of administration. Yeah. Oh, um. So personally, I prefer like infused coconut oil. I found that that's the best release. But in addition to that, like I've had some pretty like trippy experiences with that finding dosage. Right. Yes, I bet. <laughs> One but you I know what, Alicia? And I was Coconut high for three days. <laughs> I bet coconut oil actually will help heal your insides because it is yes. the world's best antibiotic and not to yes. mention a number of other things. Anti There's so many things that it fights. Antimicrobial, microbial. it's so many. It's Alicia, I think that's an excellent, excellent, I think that's excellent advice. So uh, coconut oil, do you just take it in a capsule or do you, do you put it into something, add it to something? Uh I just put it into like chocolate molds and so I'll make like a little star and then, or I'll roll it into balls and take it like pills. Yeah. But um, one thing that I find, found was that um, my specialist, he was, he's, he's anti-cannabis because he is basically paid by the pharmaceuticals, right? right. But um, right. I, before I started using cannabis, I had very bad scarring in my gut from what the Crohn's had done. And so right. all of the scopes showed this. And then I started ingesting this butter that a buddy had made for, at a compassion club. And it wasn't even high quality, like, um, right. cannabis butter. Like this is like, I mean, in 2008. Right. But nonetheless, right. I started eating it and it was just butter. It was like butter, butter. And, uh, I went for a scope and the doctor was just like amazed. He was just like, well, what, what are you doing? Like, how is it that your wow. gut has healed? so dramatically and I was just like ooh cannabis you know another opportunity <laughs> to educate and it just cr it crushed my heart that he was just like so closed minded and was just like oh wow wow oh so you're not taking your pharmaceuticals then you know what I mean oh, and it wasn't wow. about good health or achieving good health it no, was whether it was or not, not I was I buying into this system of bullshit that he buys into wow. and so that's when I fundamentally realized that Western medicine has a very tainted ideology of what medicine actually is, is yes. because medicine shouldn't poison your body. That's not medicine. You know, no. I, on that same note, Alicia, I do not understand how the doctors here in Canada can take the oath to do no harm and give mm -hmm. us some of these pharmaceuticals. That to me is absolutely, again, egregious. Unbelievable. Well, no, it's all about money fundamentally, and it's not about it money yeah. cure or healing someone. Like, if um, and, but the thing is, is okay. So I, I got, I was mad at this doctor. I was like, I'm done with you. Like, if you won't support my decision to find good health, then goodbye. And I found another GI who was like, Oh, you take cannabis? Well, that is certainly neat. And good for didn't you. put drugs on me. Didn't question my good decision. Fully supported me. So, good for you. you know, there there are you know professionals out there that are in it for the yes. right reason. But you can really yeah. tell when someone is um, not in it for the right reasons because they are they're not about good health or you achieving a, a state of good health. They're about no. pushing their ideology and what will benefit them most, and that shouldn't be the case, and especially yeah. when it comes to medicine. Sadly enough, Alicia, you touch on a very big point, though, in this issue, and that is the greed involved in not just the pharmaceutical industry, but in so many of these issues when they are, you know, like a lot of these products on the street, like cannabis, somewhat illegal. 
you know, there's greed involved in both ends, but greed in the pharmaceutical companies and the way they reach into the pockets of those of us who are marginalized and are discriminated against, you know, because we are sort of maybe less, you know, financially set than some. Well, yeah. people well, who have I disabilities or invisible disabilities, 58% of them are um, unemployed because there's a perception within society that you can't do the same work as an able-bodied person. So, of course, yes. people who have um, illness are marginalized and they can't achieve the same level of income as someone who has an able body. But isn't that um, a reason for society to accommodate and help people? Isn't you that a reason think. to be like, okay, well, you, you need to come in a few hours after 9 o'clock because yes. you don't sleep well because you're in constant pain? No worries. But yeah. it seems like people are trying to make pe- different able people fit into a system designed yes. for people who are, so quote, true. healthy. Yeah, that's you know what I mean, and it's like the the more that I try to fit into a system that was never designed to accommodate me, the more that I create suffering for myself. And once I got that, I was like, okay, you know what I mean. It's not even subscribing to oh, I'm I'm sick. It's subscribing to I'm different, and I know that, and I have to um, voice that, and I shouldn't necessarily have to fight that. I should just be accepted for being different, right? No. I so agree. Now, one thing I did want to ask, Alicia, you are quite the firecracker. With everything that you have been doing over the last number of years, especially involving cannabis as medicine, where exactly do you see yourself in five years? Not just professionally, but, you know, situated in the country as an advocate for these issues. Where do you see yourself, Alicia? Um, it, like it, it certainly depends where I get into law school. <laughs> I'm dead. I'm dead. Good um, luck, my friend. Good luck. Um, but I, I, I don't know if I intend on leaving Saskatchewan. A wise man once said, "You grow where you're planted," and yes. so I think that Saskatchewan has yeah. um, an abundance of different opportunities to provide the cannabis movement. Like, for instance, um, we here we have grow yeah. operations that are on farms. It's like. Good luck, yes. um, Mr. RCMP, <laughs> trying to find my grow up in the middle of nowhere. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So we have the luxury and I know, of a seclusion. I know in Regina. Oh, sorry, Alicia, sorry? I was just going to say, and I know in Regina, where I was born, Regina, Saskatchewan, we could watch our dog run away from home for three days. It was so flat. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And so I think that there's a there's a big opportunity here in terms of cannabis and hemp. Like, um, there is. I would love to see fields of hemp. Like, uh, there was a I saw a commercial actually today for um, hemp seeds, wow. and there's a company allegedly in Alberta that is doing quite well in terms right. of growing hemp and providing it as food. And so right. I think that there's that there's just so many different opportunities in terms of um, cannabis and hemp and. Um, I come, like, my generation, like, what, three or four generations in my family have been farmers, right? So I think that farming, not necessarily the land, but using the land to my advantage is Mm -hmm. something that I hope to do sooner than later. And and, and meanwhile, providing um, a low-cost medicine for people who really need to access it, right? Because I'm totally against LP medicine. I did a little research project as I often do with a variety of different things, but I ordered from Catamed and I ordered from Broken Coast. And let me tell you, that's not medicine. And if someone wants to purport that that's medicine, they really need to give their ideology a check because that's not medicine. Good for you. I'm I'm so glad to hear that because some people have no choice to buy from a licensed producer, they say. Yeah. But ultimately, I would take a few plants of my own medicine over that any single day of my life. What about a, a situation, Alicia, where you could get involved with the possibility of setting up some type of co-op where patients are helping other patients and growing and everybody sort of, you know, helps each other that within the Yes. Co-op. So currently there's one in Saskatchewan and it's um, a, bu- a bunch of vets. 
that are growing cannabis on a farm. That's why I say it's kind of funny because it's like, you know, how they raid um, people in the city so easily. But when yeah. you're living on a farm and you're um, kind of off grid, it's not so exactly. um, convenient <laughs> exactly. mean, for law enforcement to um, raid. And I mean, you're not either. in the public space, but you've, you've got an abundance of space and land um, to be able to have greenhouse growing because as much as, um, you know, some people are forced to grow in basements, I think that um, we're doing cannabis as a medicine a great injustice by continuing to grow in basements because of the um, yes. susceptibility of mold and mildew. Like, you I can so. mitigate against it, but there's nothing like buds that are growing in a greenhouse Our by door. the sun. You I know what agree. I mean? Like. And so, um, like, I'm not an expert on growing. I'm, I'm very new. This is a whole new right. platform to you me. Lived on a, <laughs> but, but you grew uh, up on a farm. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? She's a smart girl. Sunshine and outdoors is the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh. now, so, uh, you know, like, like I, think, on there. I, I guess I'm, my opinion comes. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, my opinion comes from, I guess, just um, using a different varieties of medicine. Like, I am very, very sensitive to mold and mildew now because of the yes. drugs that I took for my Crohn's disease because they, um, not hindered, but definitely, um, also, like, lack of a better term, term, screwed with my immune system's <laughs> ability to fight off things. And so no, no, um, fungal no. infections, especially with meso mesotrexate, is a big thing uh, and so yeah, no just the doubt. slightest bit of mold in cannabis yeah. um, affects me quite profoundly and so that's why i'm always constantly looking for that very very clean source of yeah. cannabis yes, to not, not only you know, baby, alicia, but ingest, you know alicia sorry just on that note alicia i just wanted to say it's so important again that people who do take up this uh uh, endeavor of growing their own medicine on for themselves realize that things like molds and mildews and all of these things bugs affect their way their medicine you know uh, is you know ultimately taken by them you know whether it be affecting their breathing or changing the taste or something you know they need to be aware so it's important that people know these mm. things too Alicia well, and, and, and another thing, too, it speaks to the fact that the government wants to purport that there's safety issues in terms of cannabis use. And no, the only uh, safety issue here is that prohibition has um, systematically made people have to grow cannabis in unsavory places, which has led yes. to um, it being grown in conditions that are conducive to mold and mildew, like yes. in a greenhouse. Um, As a it, former corrections here. officer, again, I saw a lot of that. You bet, Alicia. The, um, you know, oh, for sure. And, and the thing is, is like um, moldy medicine. Is it really medicine? Then, well, not, not really. At all. You know what not I mean? Like, and, and there's lots to of those of us, to those of us desperate, though, Alicia, it is. That's the sad, sad yeah. part. That's the reality of this whole situation. Is that moldy well, see, medicine guess, is like, better every, than no medicine? Everyone's body works differently, though, right? So yes. if your yes, body can... Like, well, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess exactly. you, you as well. Uh, immune issues, uh, big problem there when it comes to moldy cannabis. Yeah. Uh, Alicia, you mentioned uh, methotrexate. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> I I had to do injections for three years, and God. I'll tell you, God, that God. was yeah. Now, and you also mentioned uh, earlier in the show about chemo. Was that yes. a um, was that um, there's a drug out there called Remicade? Was that huh. the same thing? Wow. See, oh. the thing is, is my very first drug was Imuran that I was given, and I had such a bad reaction to it that I got pancreatitis and I couldn't get out of bed for three weeks. So I was hospitalized. Oh, no. and I oh. I had to wear those jazzy socks, but um, oh, I was vomiting sweet. so profusely that I tore my esophagus. 
So that was an indication that my body was saying, hey, no, like drugs in me don't work. So then my doctor gave me Remicade and I I, um, woke up after the infusion and I couldn't move. So I had to take EMS to the hospital. (laughs) Luckily, my body couldn't fight against methotrexate. So yeah, I took methotrexate for quite some time. And that's the reason why I'm dealing now with fungal stuff. Is right, because um, right. it, it stunts your ability to fight off fungal of infections, course. right? Uh, I understand that, Alicia, with all the pills I've consumed in my lifetime. Boy, I yeah. certainly understand. Yeah, exactly. Was, and so, Al, when you took methotrexate, did you get the vomiting from it? Because you got it through, like in, in a needle, and they dressed up in their little gowns and dresses when they gave it to no. you, I suppose? Mm-hmm. No, um, I had to do self-administration. I had to do it right here at home. Oh, um, the oh. very first time that the very first time that I went to get the needle, like I brought all my supplies from the from the um, uh, pharmacy, and when I went and picked it all up, I said, "Well, I I don't know how to inject myself." So I made the appointment, went up to the health unit, and I gave them the medication. And the nurse came out, and she was dressed in a gown, goggles, mask, and gloves. Wow. So she could, so she could administer <laughs> yeah. the stuff into but my they were arm. That wow. Into you. So it's supposed to be put in my stomach. Oh, my God. So she put it in the wrong spot. But she, I said, what's with all this stuff you're wearing? And uh, she says, oh, it's safety precautions. I could get cancer <gasps> if I touch it. Oh, my God. And what about you, yeah. my well, friend? They- they say that if it touched like ordinary skin, it would make you sterile. Wow! Yeah, wow. yeah. Three years oh, of injections. Yeah. Wow! Three years of injections, and then I I did uh, approximately seven years of the pill, and I'm no longer on methotrexate or Remicade. Thank God! Wow! Because I I ended up with melanoma skin cancer. Yes, of course. Wow. Mm-hmm. So you can't have you can't have anything, any infections, oh when you're, even a cold when you're on the, on those drugs. No, yeah, no, I know. Yeah, God, I actually know a few MS patients who actually had chemotherapies and um, complete blood transfusions to get relief. And boy, I couldn't imagine what all of you went through. I couldn't even imagine. Thank God I only had, as I say, don't have MS, I am a mess. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, Alicia, we're down to about the final 10 minutes here. Uh, I always like to try to check with the guests to see if there was anything that uh, you would like to bring up or mention before we wrap things up. Um, I guess um, our your listeners can check out our page. So it's just uh, Facebook slash Sask Mess, mm-hmm. and that's basically our hub of where we share information, events, and um, yeah. Uh, I guess I don't really post presentations, but if someone would like a presentation in our area, they can definitely contact um, yes. us on there. Um, and that's yeah, the Saskatchewan of, Medical Cannabis Association, right? Alicia, Saskatchewan yeah, Medical Cannabis Association on Facebook. Yes, correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, they can yeah. get a hold of us in that regard. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is there, is, is there anything, you know, I'm not looking for, I wasn't really looking for a shout out, but that was great. Uh, I just wonder if there's anything else that you're you're dealing with at home or um, some type of advocacy. Um, Anything you know, like you want that, that you wanted to mention before we before we. Uh, yeah. no? um, I guess just in terms of advocacy, I don't know if we'll be doing any kind of event. Have you um, folks seen anything like different? You know how people usually have like rallies and stuff. I guess the government really hasn't done anything yeah. too atrocious right. yet to warrant one. But um, yeah, right. definitely. If something comes up, we'll pre- we'll be prepared to um, hold they the event look, for sure. Definitely, they can look on your Facebook page. Definitely, it's the Saskatchewan Medical yeah, Cannabis sure. Association. Just quickly, before um, being that uh, for announcements of events and stuff like that, these things that you do at the hospital for these presentations, do you ever do any of these things that are accessible for the public to come and see? The story? These uh, these presentations that you do in the hospital with doctors and and, uh, and talk about uh, cannabis, 
Do you ever do anything like that where it's accessible for the public to come and listen? Oh, for sure. We do advertising and, and posters and stuff, but that's more of a local sense. But um, you, you just um, sparked my interest in terms of um, I should probably get someone to YouTube that, like take them and, and make them obsess- accessible yeah. on that the Internet. So they can kind yeah. of um, take a look. That's probably something that we'll do in our next um, sessions for sure. Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of people now are using the Facebook Lives and stuff. Oh, I didn't even know there was such a thing. <laughs> Facebook Live? Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Facebook Live, okay, I'll look into it for sure. <laughs> Once I'm filming yes. for next month. <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, Okay. so people can find you at um, Saskatchewan Medical Cannabis Association on Facebook. Sure. You haven't got any, tw- no Twitter accounts or anything? Instagram? No, we predominantly no. use just Facebook and yeah, so uh, our yeah. local stuff. Like, I still like to leave um, my business cards around different cities That's and stuff. Awesome. So people can, um, I still get you know, uh, random calls from people like, hey, I found your card in the coffee shop, or hey, I found it in the bathroom. <laughs> so I still you like know. to do that. But um, yeah, no, we predominantly use Facebook. So it's a good yeah. source. Local. Local stuff is something that is very important. It's the grassroots. It's those. It's, you get the people to change their minds, then they help get the, the governments to change theirs. You bet. So um, that's great. Thank you much, uh, Alicia, for that. Um, for all your hard work. Okay, Allison. Thank um, you, Alicia. Have you got somebody, something you want to throw a shout out to? You know what? I can't think of anything right now that I'm doing but the good old, same old, busy little me. I'm always busy doing stuff, and I've got some things up my sleeve, and I would love it if people checked it out at my website at Allison Merton, A-L-I-S-O-N-M-Y-R-D-E-N dot C-A and dot com i think one of them might be my old website but they're slowly changing over but i am as always up to no good because they're me yeah, or follow you on facebook or follow me anywhere i'm on facebook linkedin <laughs> myspace google instagram twitter you name it i do it you i'm a busy woman that's right. Okay, uh, and I'm going to remind everybody that I will be back next Wednesday with my joint host Kim Cooper, and her and her scheduled guest, I believe, is down near you somewhere, Allison, and that is Charlene Freeman. Beautiful. I'm not aware of Charlene, so I'll tune in and definitely learn more. Yeah. As um, always, well, we're going to we're going to be talking about creams and lotions and uh, much more. Beautiful. Um, Yes, it's going to be it's going to be very interesting because uh, I know there's lots of people who are interested in that stuff. Yeah, uh, she was she was actually on one of the panels uh, during the Karma Cup that was held at the Vibra Central. Well, I recognize her name from being around in the community, so I can't yeah. wait. I'm telling you, there are a lot of people. I don't even know if I've met them or not met them, but I know I know many. So <laughs> my apologies, Charlene, if we've met before, sweetheart. But I will be listening. So yeah, make sure you tune in next Wednesday for that. Uh, you can find Pace, you can find Pace on Twitter at Pace Radio, and you can also like us on Facebook, and you can also find us on the uh, web at pace-online.ca. As always, thank you to go out to our sponsors, the friendly folks at BMA Hydroponics in Belleville, Ontario. They're found on the web at bmahydroponics.com. Also, thank you to CC Nexus Canada's Cannabis Seed Wholesaler. Uh, they can be found at ccnexus.global. And I believe for wholesale end of things, they've got some special going on right now. So give them a shout. And producer Al Rap of uh, lifestyleradio.ca. Couldn't you do this bet. alone. You betcha. <laughs> and a big thank you to our guest, Alicia Smith. And a huge uh, thank you, Al Graham. <laughs> thank yeah, you, Alice. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, thank, yeah, thanks, Alicia, for coming on and uh, being a voice. Our introduction song always talks about people need to speak up, and it was great having you on the show and uh, hearing you speak. So, thank you so much, Alicia. Awesome. I appreciate you having me. Okay. And uh, as always, always like to thank the listeners for tuning in the program. Um, 
we really appreciate you uh, doing that. And like everybody does, uh, quite often it gets shared around. So uh, yeah, thank you uh, for that. Right and, on. Yep, thank you and good night. Good night. See you next Wednesday. Good night. Good night. What are you doing? Nothing. Nothing? Why not? I'm trying to get on the Slice Down Radio website. Sounds like a cool website. Yeah, it's alright. Oh, I might have it. You might have it. You're listening to Life.